So um, I've been praying this week about what we were going to do in this new year and um, and kind of what series we were going to embark on for this first quarter of the year. And um, as I was doing so, I was receiving from many of you your Christmas letters as well as Christmas letters from lots of other folks I know. And um, and it was it was amazing to read about kind of these high points and these low points. One particular friend of mine left his spot in ministry to um, take another role in a homeless shelter that fits him perfectly. Um, his son joined the military and and he lost um, two of his three dogs this year. I mean, I mean everything in between from great, great, beautiful things to challenging things to other things that just change. And, um, and I realized that we have no clue what 2017 holds for us, except for the fact that we will not be in the same place this time next year as we are right now. It is virtually impossible for us to be the same. And so um, it got me thinking about and praying about what is God going to do? How is God going to shape our lives? What sort of things are going to go on in our lives? And how can we engage with God um, to get the most out of this year? And I did a little math. Well, I let my computer do a little math for me. Um, we have 525,000 minutes ahead of us in 2017. <laughs> and any one of those minutes could be a formidable moment. We don't know which ones they are. Um, and my hope and my prayer and my expectation is that God is going to do some beautiful and amazing things in our lives. That we are going to move forward with Him and we're going to be blessed in this year. Um, but I also want to be intentional about it because I think intentionality does a lot. We are open to what God has for us. And if we're um, pliable to what His will is, I believe that He can do even more. Um, at Christmas Eve service, John shared a verse that... Um, meant a lot to him. He actually wants it on his tombstone. And it's a verse that, that I've carried with me a long time and it means a lot to me as well. It's Philippians 1 6 and it says this Being confident in of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And what Paul is saying in this passage is that Jesus has started an ongoing work in your life and in my life. And he's continually doing that work until he comes again. Any of you in the middle of a house remodel right now? Man, those are crazy. Things get turned upside down, broken up, or, or ever put back together like a car did, did a, a car restoration. Um, things can go a little sideways during those, but the long view is that something is being restored, something is being brought to its fullest spot, and I think that's what God wants to do in, in our lives. Um, and so, so we're going to focus on crucial moments of people in Scripture, um, and we're going to look at crucial moments in our lives, and, and how does that come about, how do we engage them with faith so that God can use them in the best way possible. Um, as I was considering these crucial moments, um, it occurred to me that a few of them we kind of know are a big deal. Like, we, we know this is going to be a big deal. Like, what career am I going to embark on? Or um, getting married, that's kind of a big moment you know is going to shape your life in a significant way. Or um, if you decide to have a kid and then the kid is on it, this is going to be a big deal. It's going to be a, a game changer. Um, these are the obvious moments, but um, many of the moments that are crucial moments in our lives we don't see coming. And they may even be little tiny ones, but as we look back on our lives, we kind of see that there's been a domino effect from that one start spot. And God has done something um, significant in it. As I was thinking about how it is that I came to be in this particular spot, um, getting to talk about the Lord with you all, it, um, I remembered back to this one little tiny prayer moment that I had where um, I was so thankful for what God had done in my life. I was going down a path that was just going to wreck me, and, and God saved me from that and set me on a new path and, um, and in a good place. And, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful for what you've done. If you ever give me a chance to share that story, I'll share it. Little tiny prayer. Um, fast forward to a summer camp, and I got there, and they said, well, everybody's going to get to do public speaking while you're here. 
You're all going to get to share your story, your testimony of what God has done in your life to bring you here. And we're going to teach you how to do that a little bit. And um, as it turned out, I got this weird role of being a part of the commitment night and painting and whatever. Anyways, it always was followed up with a talk. So everybody else got to give their testimony once, and I got to give mine every week to 100 <laughs> kids. Um, and I was nervous and terrified. And then uh, I went back to Bible school, and I was, I was on the, the worship planning team, and we would always ask professors to speak. And this one particular week, uh, we couldn't get anybody. And so, being the person who was responsible for making sure we had a chapel, um, <laughs> I go, I guess i got to speak. And here I was, fairly new Christian, sitting in front of a whole bunch of kids who were pastor kids, missionaries kids, lifelong Christians and going, what do I have? And professors who I respected deeply going, what do I have to share with them? And I have no clue how that sermon went. It was probably horrible. Um, I know it was on pruning and what God does when he prunes our lives, but um, somehow this little tiny moment of saying, God, I guess I'll share if you give me an opportunity turned into something that I found myself doing for the last 20 years. Um, little tiny moments can be big moments. Another moment that I had uh, was uh, we had a, a worship service every Tuesday night. It was, it was singing, and it was chanting, and it was music. I'm not a particularly musical person. That's why you've never seen me up there on the higher stage. Um, but I remember uh, always we, we'd all kind of show up at that service at, at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night, and people would bring their instruments, and anybody who wanted to play could play, and it was always the same exact service. It was like the best first kind of service in um, anyways, it was finals week, and I showed up to this service, and nobody else was there. And I had my flute, which is the only thing I know how to play. And so, there's a moment of decision, and I go, well, why do we even get together and worship? And I decided that it wasn't just for um, the people, it was a gift to God that we give. And I was committed to worshiping. And so I put together my little flute, I put my music on the stand, and I began to play the songs and chant the chants and do the readings that it said to nobody at all except the Lord. And um, in that little moment that nobody saw, a commitment to worship and to what worship was about happened in me. I don't know what your moments will be this year, but I know they're coming. I know that sometime while you're at work, or while you're talking to somebody, or while you're walking down the street, or while you're sitting in the car, uh, you will have a moment when you will get to make a decision to live out of faith or not. And how you engage that moment will shape what happens this year and where you find yourself a year from now. Um, and so, I want to make the most of these moments. And so for the next quarter, we're going to look at moments and how they shape lives and how they come about. Um, today, we're going to look at um, a moment of courage. How do we be more courageous? I think uh, we did a series last year on, on fear, and, and my guess is that everybody is going to have moments this year that they're scared of something. Um, it's, it's pretty impossible to avoid those. And, and I wonder how we might engage with faith and courage in those moments. So um, we're going to look at a familiar story, the story of David and Goliath, a um, great moment of courage in Scripture, and um, see what it has to, to say about it. So let's pray before I read the Scripture for us. God, thank you that you embark with us on this year, that you have started a great work, not uh, just in this church, not just in your kingdom, but in our lives. And I pray that you would guide us and how to make the most out of the moments we're given. We, none of them are a guarantee, and yet you keep giving them. And so, Lord, may we make the most out of it. May we become better people, better friends, better um, workers, better spouses, better um, friends of yours this year because of what you're doing. Amen. All right. So um, I'm going to read the first 11 verses, and then I'm going to skip a whole bunch, and we'll, we'll read um, 32 through 38. So this is 1 Samuel 17. It says this, 
Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Saka in Judah. And they pitched camps at Ephes Demim between Saka and Azekah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up battle lines to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley between them. And a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin was slung to his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. And Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me, and if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight together. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And this went on day after day for 40 days. Goliath would come out and shout insults, defy the Lord day after day. And the only response was, we're really scared. No one wants to go down there. Until a 15-year-old boy was coming to bring his brothers some lunch. And uh, let me read for you what he had to say. And then David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replied, You're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. He's been a fighting man since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Don't you see the connection? He was keeping sheep while this guy's been training for war. Of course, this prepared him beautifully for this moment. Uh, and, but while keeping sheep, when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I would go after it. I'd strike it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And then when the animal turned on me, I seized it by its hair and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear is going to deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And so Saul said to David, Go, the Lord be with you. Sixteen-year-old boy who's used to keeping sheep sees what's going on and stepped up. Um, did you catch in there why David did it? I would look at that and go, well, he's been training for war his entire life since he was a youth. This kid is a youth, has no battle training whatsoever. But David said this, when I was keeping sheep, a bear or a lion would come upon the sheep and I would go strike it. And the Lord rescued me that and delivered the sheep. So why would this be any different? Um, now, we don't know the backstory of how his shepherding went. My guess is not every time an animal came up did David successfully have this adventure. Very few of us are courageous every single moment of every day. My guess is the first time an animal came and took away one of the sheep, David went home with less sheep than he came that day and talked to his dad, and his dad said, we can't afford to lose any more sheep to animal. You've got to figure out a way to protect these. This is what you do as a shepherd. And so the next time an animal came, and it probably wasn't a giant lion or a giant bear, maybe it was like a warthog or something, <laughs> David steeled his nerves, prayed a little prayer, and then went after him. And the sheep got set free and the animal ran off. And maybe another time he uh, 
went after the animal, and after it dropped the sheep, when he struck it with his shepherd's staff, the animal decided it didn't like getting struck with his giant stick, and turned and attacked David. And yet, after that moment, David was still there. And he realized God must have watched over him and protected him. <clears throat> Um, there were hundreds and hundreds of these little moments in David's history where he had seen God take care of him, where he had seen God um, rescue him. And so David had this unwavering trust that should he put himself in a position of danger for the Lord, doing the right thing, that God would show up. So when David sees a battle situation that we all go, man, he is not prepared for that. He goes, well, God protected me every other time. Why wouldn't he protect me now? Um, the secret to David's courage was a hundred little formative moments um, where he trusted God. And um, as he stepped into them, God was faithful. I don't know what your battles look like. I can I can share with you some of mine. Um, I never feel adequate to lead. I just don't. I don't feel adequate to lead this church into exactly what God has for it. I never wake up in the morning and go, man, I've got everything it takes, God. I got this without you. The same thing with preaching. Um, I'm terrified to preach. I also grew up in a household where um, we don't fight. That's weird. And so when I see conflict going on, I it tends to be like, mm, I just want to smooth things out or withdraw. And so when conflict comes up in my family, um, or when conflict comes up with Christina, I'm learning to step out into this and go, I don't need to be afraid of this. I'm going to walk into this and see how God unfolds it. Here's another random one that you might not have expected. Small talk with strangers terrifies me. So when somebody comes in the door at Harbor that I don't know, I have to like force myself to go, oh, okay. I need to go greet this person and shake hands with them. Um, I don't know why I'm so terrified of that, and yet, there it is. But the more I do it, the more comfortable I get. And now Christina kind of rolls her eyes at me because we'll be sitting there at a restaurant and I'll start talking to the waiter and trying to figure out how he's doing this day. Um, the poor checkout person at the grocery store just wants to bag my groceries and I want to find out how their holidays have been. Um, sort of stepped up and into these moments and built them. Um, and when we do this, when we step into something that the Lord has for us, um, it becomes easier to do again and again. So that's the good news. The, the, the bad news is that many of us, I think, um, have a tendency to want to step up only in the moment when it really matters. And, and it's foolish to think that um, when something big comes along, we'll have what it takes to engage it. Um, that the Lord uses a lot of tiny moments to build a character in us. And that's really what we're talking about. How does God form us? To build a character in us, to prepare us for the moments when it really is crucial. Um, a pastor friend of mine put it this way. Every private victory results in a public victory. God is preparing us in simple things, in daily things, in unspiritual things to shape us to be the king and queen he has called us to be. Um, Jesus put it this way, Luke 16. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling your worldly wealth, who would trust you with true riches? If you've not been trustworthy with someone's property, who would give you property? What he's saying is if you want to be a more caring person, go out of your comfort zone to care for somebody. If you want to be a more honest person, find a space that maybe you're tempted not to be. If you want to be a better friend, um, think of someone and just do a friendly act towards them. 
that you wouldn't normally do. If you want to be more generous, give where you wouldn't have given before. In these little tiny moments that maybe go completely unnoticed, God is building something in us that God can use in tremendous ways. Um, J.D. Rockefeller is considered by many to be the richest person of all time, oil magnet. Um, but he was also a, a, a man of deep faith, which makes him a very interesting study. Um, he, he wasn't a paragon of virtue by any means, but when it came to money, he, he wanted to be faithful to the Lord. Um, and it showed, uh, he, he kept uh, very, very detailed letters. And at the age of 16, um, he very, very clearly was giving 6% of his income either back to the church or to, to religious causes. Um, we know him now in kind of history as giving a tremendous amount to public health, to education, all sorts of places. Um, but here's what he had to say about it. He really believed that God gave him everything that he had. He said, I would have tithed. Um, by the way, later on in life, he was giving way more than 10% of his income away. Well, that was just who it was. But um, I wouldn't have tithed on my first million if I didn't tithe on my first salary, which was $1.15 a week. So I'm picturing this guy, his first salary, um, $1.50 a week, selling newspapers or something. And he's taking 15 cents out of that, writing it down in his ledger that he's doing it, consistent practice. And what that practice prepared him for was when God gave him much, much more that he could be generous with it. I know that um, I myself have had this conversation, I don't know how many times, um, of, well, I would give to this, this, or this if I won the lottery. And that's kind of my brother's theory, too. We've had this discussion a lot. What would we do if we won the lottery? Um, and it occurred to me as I was praying through this and thinking through this that um, I wouldn't know what to do if I won the lottery. But if I have a character of generosity before I win the lottery, that would probably be better. And that I highly doubt that um, somebody who hasn't developed that character would be able to do it. Um, the reality is this week, gyms will be full, packed to overflowing every minute of every day. And there will be a bunch of people in there. And they will be trying to be faithful with 10 minutes on that treadmill. <laughs> Many of them will be gone by the end of January. No worries, you'll get your gym back. Um, <laughs> But the ones that are faithful with 10 minutes will find themselves with 15 minutes. The ones with 5 pounds on their weights will find themselves able to handle 10 pounds. Um, this idea of God giving a little and that preparing us for the next thing is, is sort of, <coughs> it's a natural law. It's, it's a way that he works. Um, now, I have no desire to be able to lift hundreds and hundreds of pounds. That's why I, you won't find me there. Um, but I do have a desire to be a better husband and friend and lover of God and lover of people. And I can wish for that, but it's another thing to engage that and to step into that. And I truly believe that God will use that, will meet us in those moments, those crucial moments, be they small and significant, seen by none, to shape in us who he wants us to be. Um, so how do you want to grow? In 2017, how do you want to grow in the Lord this year? What what would you like to see God do? If it's a better understanding of Scripture, I got a suggestion: read a little bit of Scripture every day. You'll find yourself getting it. Um, Max Lucado, Christian author, um, he's doing this cool challenge with his church that I thought was really neat, and it's. Um, it's a prayer challenge. He's doing a series called Before Amen. Um, and his suggestion uh, and challenge to people is pray for four minutes a day for four weeks and your life will change forever. Four minutes a day. I can do that. 
I have ADD, but I can focus for four minutes. Um, but there's something consistent about it. And I, I believe that that's what it would do. And so, so here's my homework slash challenge for us. Um, I want to encourage your, you this year to kind of prayerfully write a letter to yourself about where you would like to see God move in your life. What's the battle right now? What's the place you want to grow? What's the thing you want to see God do? Write a letter to yourself. Pop it in an envelope. Seal it up. And then bring it to church with you and give it to me next week. In three months, I will mail it back to you. And you can get a letter from yourself. I'll even put the stamp on it for you. <laughs> and you can see how God has shown up. And if you haven't stepped into it, it'll be a chance for you to review that kind of kind of step. Um, the other challenge I have for you is simply this. Take a small step into whatever direction you want to go. Um, pray and trust Step out in a little bit of faith with a little bit of courage into where you want to see God move in your life this year. And trust that the Lord will meet you there. Sound good?